Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Wabash Valley Lean Network. Um, this rainy Friday morning, um, we've got a great presentation here lined up for you. Wabash Valley Lean Network is a, a group of 125 companies, mostly through the state of Indiana, but uh, also in some of the surrounding states. We focus on process improvement using lean principles and tools. And if you sum it up in, in four words, it's really learning, sharing, meeting, and improving. That's what we try to do. We have regular meetings in, in monthly in Lafayette and Indianapolis, six times a year in Bloomington, and four times a year up at Valparaiso University. And since uh, COVID and we've gotten better at live streaming, we're gonna continue to live stream even, even though we are, uh, even though when we do get back to in-person meetings, and hopefully that'll be in August. That's our that's our goal for August to be back to in-person meetings with also the, the option to live stream that. So you'll be able to stay connected with us uh, a couple different ways. I usually put a slide up now, but I'm trying to get through this pretty quick because we have a lot to cover today. But Dr. Deming says, if you can't describe what you're doing as a process, then you really don't know what you're doing. And that's very true. If you think about it, everything we do in life, everything we do in our in our work, it's, it's a process. It may not be repeatable. It may not be defined. It may not be a very good process, but it's still a process. And, and one of the things we can do is, is more is look at our processes, understand those and, and try to improve those processes using the lean tools. Definition of a successful Wabash Valley Lean Network meeting is much like, um, much like your own projects. What, our first criteria is, did you learn something today that you will use to help you and your organization improve? We don't want this to be just some uh, high level lecture, but it's, uh, it's really a way, can you take something from this that you'll use tomorrow or use later in the week in your job or in your life? And secondly, and again, a little tough with COVID, did you talk with someone today who helped or will help you and your organization improve? So we're all about helping you improve, helping you get better, helping you make your organization better. And that's that's the key. Agenda today, I'm going to be off the stage here in just a moment. And we're going to have a presentation, Go Big, Think Small, Unlocking the Hidden Power of Frontline Ideas with Dr. Dean Schroeder. And... Uh, Dean drove all the way from Valparaiso today so we could be in the same room here together to present on a, on a rainy day. And uh, so uh, kudos for him just for making the trip. And uh, secondly, it's a, it's a great presentation. Then I'll do a real short closing and uh, we'll call it good for today. I would like to say before we get started, consider joining Wabash Valley Lean Network. It's, uh, it, is, it is a membership group. Um, it costs $500 a year to be a member for your company and anybody can attend then the meetings or it's $250 for an individual. Um, I guarantee you'll learn, you'll, you'll have ideas that will save you way, way, way more money than that. So it's, it's uh, as I like to say, it's crazy cheap for what it provides. And we've got also, also a lot of other great benefits besides the meetings. So, but the most important thing is you can meet, engage, and network with highly motivated individuals and leaders driving improvement in their companies. And no matter how much you look on YouTube or, or search the internet, that, that value of being in the same room with 100 people facing the same battles and fighting the same fires that you're fighting, that's, uh, as a TV commercial says, that's priceless. So I, I consider... Consider joining, uh, consider joining the group. It's, it's a great group of people. So with that, I'm going to turn the virtual stage over to, um, well, I guess I need to introduce him a little bit here, don't I? Dr. Schroeder is an award-winning author, consultant, and scholar. His work focuses on creating high-performing organizations and improving people's work lives through the application of better management. He's got many awards. Um, I'd spend half the meeting talking about the awards he's won, but one that really hits home for us is he's won a couple of Shingo prizes. And for people who do the kind of work we do, that's, that's like an Olympic gold medal. He has an extensive experience in industry and education. He's actually in the process of getting another book published. So he's a, he's a busy guy. 
and we're fortunate to have him with us today. So with that, I'm going to turn the virtual stage over to Dr. Dean Schroeder. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, Doug. I always enjoy uh, talking before the uh, Wabash Valley Lean Network uh, audiences, mostly because when we do it in person, I get to always meet wonderful people who are doing uh, terrific things and to uh, make their companies and their employees better. Today's topic is one that's near and dear to my heart, which is uh, the power of small ideas. You know, most of the time we get sucked into this go big or go home type of mentality when actually what I found out throughout my career was that oftentimes it's the small ideas that really matter. So we don't know. But there's a problem with small ideas. Small ideas, you know, like the old comedian uh, Rodney Dangerfield, just don't get any respect. They just don't get any respect. What we're going to do is when we finish and look at all the reasons why the real power and improvement is in small ideas, not the big ones. When we look at that, we'll double back and look at why they don't get any respect. Okay. For, you know, everyone is fascinated. Well, did we lose it? Uh, and there you go. Everyone is fascinated uh, by the big, the excitement. You know, to quote Daniel Burnham, you know, make no small plans. They have no power, no magic to stir men's blood. And the whole thing is we're accustomed to thinking in that way. It's exciting, stuff like that. But you ever think about a big idea? A lot of interesting things about big ideas when you really start looking at them. First of all, they're often disruptive, they're expensive, they take time, they're high risk, and sometimes they don't work. And when you've taken a jump, a leap for a big idea and it doesn't work, you know, what happens? It, uh, it, it creates a lot of problems, a lot of issues. So what we find is the real secret is going after small ideas. Now, what we found in our research, we've been researching this for about 35 years. Uh, it's interesting when I look back uh, what we found along the way and what we discovered, but we've been looking into the, we first uh, really came across officially, we've been practicing, and I've been practicing in industry, but uh, we back in the late eighties, when we visited Japan and saw that what they were really doing that was really different was there what they called Kaizen at the time, not a Kaizen Blitz, but a Kaizen, which was their continuous improvement program. And they were getting tons and tons of small ideas from their people. And we looked at that and said, yeah, that makes sense. That's, that's what we do. And they certainly weren't using suggestion boxes. So we've been studying small ideas and the power of small ideas for a long time. And what we've discovered along the way is they are four to five times more improvement potential in small ideas than there are big ideas. It might, might surprise you, but not when you start taking it apart. So let's look at some of the reasons why. Our first reason, most small ideas have deceptively large impact. Now, Doug was talking earlier about the importance of taking a process focused. That's critical here because think of what most, most small ideas do. What is most small ideas? Most small ideas are slight improvements in a process that is handled many times, that is repeated many, many times throughout a day. Just a small improvement, not necessarily something big, but just a little bit, but it's repeated many times a day, many times a week, many times a month, many times a year, for as long as that process is in place. And it's just there chunking away, chunking away. Let's look at a couple of my favorites. One of my favorites actually comes from Coca-Cola bottling in Sweden. You've all seen the shape of the, this is the one liter bottle. And what they were finding was they had this one liter bottle plant. It was really kind of fascinating. You're in there and you watch it. And I don't know if you've ever seen a bottling plant, but those bottles are moving. As a matter of fact, they're going at about the same pace as a machine gun, okay? And the bottles are coming around and they go around a, a carousel, they go around a carousel and they get capped and then they come to a corner because you can't go just straight. They come to a corner and they move around the corner and they're, they're nicely spaced going in that corner and then they bunch a little. They come around the corner, there's an electric eye there to see that it's been filled properly. And then if it hasn't been, 
either it's high, too high or too low, a piston opens, pushes it off, pushes that bottle off. Okay, it works fine, except when they're bunched and sometimes that piston and the friction cocks the next bottle, it falls over, it jams the line, and then these bottles coming around the corner at the speed of a machine gun are hitting that blockage. You've got bottles going all over the place and you can imagine what happens with, with fizzy bottles when they hit and explode and, and all this sort of stuff. Well, they figure that's a big problem, makes a big mess up to a couple times a day sometimes. And so uh, they put a Six Sigma team on it, a black belt Six, Six Sigma team. And they look at it and they check the curve and they check the, you know, they lubricate it with, with Teflon tape and they adjust the speed, try it lower, try it faster. Well, what they finally came up with is a bunch of ideas to clean up the mess faster. They're cleaning up the mess faster. They didn't stop the mess from happening. And so um, they got very good at cleaning up the mess. One of the service techs that was sitting there, one of the, one of the, one of the nice ones was looking at this and he's the one actually cleaning up the mess. All of a sudden, bang, it explodes. He's got to rush out there, grab all the cleanup equipment, get the line, you know, get everything straightened around, get the line going again. What he discovered, what he discovered was he looked at that and he said, you know, if you just cock that angle just a little bit to reduce the friction around that corner, all of a sudden the bottles won't bunch. And so he went to the machine shop, grabbed a, a nickel washer, put it in, cocked it, ended the problem. Small idea, small idea, a washer, had a washer, big results. What it ended up saving is about $15,000 a year in material costs. In other words, cleaned up material, cleaned up uh, Coca-Cola all over the place. But that didn't even look at what it saved in, what it added in terms of production time. Let's look at another one in a different setting. Just for fun, let's completely change it. Let's go to a government situation of all things. Denver Excise and Licensing. Denver Excise and Licensing uh, is an interesting place for a lot of reasons. We'll get into a little bit of that in a couple more slides. But one of the things they were doing is they were trying to reduce the length of wait times. But what happened is they kept getting interrupted. In the corner, they had a, they had a computer set up where people could do their own background checks. Now, Denver's the Mile High City. It's a Mile High City for another reason these days. And what they did is they had just put in like 17 new, no, seven new licenses for uh, cannabis, for marijuana, everything from uh, uh, cultivation to retail sales. And a lot of that is in cash because of uh, government rules and stuff like that, because it's nationally still illegal. So they're dealing in cash a lot. And, and so there's a big demand all of a sudden for security guards. And one of the things you do as a security guard is you need a background check. So this computer was set up to do a background check. You'd go over there, but the software was a son of a gun and they kept getting lost. The applicants kept getting lost and interrupting the service techs. Well, the service techs came up with an idea. The solution was to create a clear instruction manual, step-by-step step with screenshots and arrows, you know, push this button, fill this in, you know, don't forget this. And they completely eliminated that problem. What happened? They saved five minutes every interruption, 36 times a day on average. That adds up to 750 hours per year. Not insignificant, one little idea. But then the other thing you've got to remember is there are lots of ideas, lots of ideas. So you got these little ideas that are actually much more powerful than you give them credit to. You know, a simple washer saving $15,000, this saving 750, essentially a third, better than a third of a person, time for a year, going on in perpetuity until the process changes. So these little process improvements, this is where process improvement gets important, build up. And then when you have lots of them, lots of these frontline ideas, lots of these improvements, think of the effect you can have. Let's look at, look at this. Uh, some of the companies we've studied implement 20, 30, even 500 
or 50, excuse me, 50 or more ideas per person per year. Implemented changes. Can you imagine if you got 50 ideas per person to improve your processes every year? Just little things. They really add up. As a matter of fact, we've actually been in companies that have gone over, over 100. We might talk about those if we have time. Let's go back to Denver. What did it do for Denver? Denver licensing reduced their wait time from an average of an hour and 40 minutes. And by the way, the peak, peak waits were five hours. They went from an hour and 40 minutes to seven minutes with peaks of 15. Okay, bang. And uh, we actually went back, they did that over a nine month period. And when they first started their, their program and we went back a couple of years later for a follow-up, there was no line at all, no line at all. And as a matter of fact, they'd made some pretty good strategic changes because now they aren't, don't have place screaming and their people had more time to work on it. Third thing to look at, big problems can rarely be solved by management action alone. They require lots of small ideas. Think of any big change. Take, a, take something as simple as, a, as a, um, uh, a network change. You're going to change your computer network, okay? What happens? New system goes in. It's different, it's different. But in order to get it to work, there's lots of little changes that are needed. As a matter of fact, whenever I'm working with a company that's going to do that, one of the things I tell them is make sure you get your people to complain a lot in the beginning. Why complain? Tell them it's all right to complain. Then they're not going to be grudging the new system. They're going to say, give us your ideas on how to fix it. And all of a sudden, you can, you can learn much, much faster with lots of these little ideas. You have a lot of little ideas. As a matter of fact, big ideas are much different when you start taking them apart and looking at it. For example, frontline driven improvement makes a unit more innovative. Okay. You know, usually when you think of innovation, you don't think of small ideas, do you? Problem is they're quite closely related. They're actually quite closely related. Let's look at an example that I think all of you guys can, can will stick with all of you guys. That's the 3M post-it notes. You guys, everyone knows post-it note. Everyone's heard a lot of the stories about post-it notes. Brilliant, huge idea by Art Fry. Um, actually, I got to spend a good deal of time with Art Fry one afternoon and uh, we talked and the way he explains it, there really wasn't a big idea involved. There was an aha moment. His aha moment was when he was losing, losing track of where he was in the hymnal because he was singing in the choir. And the slips that he put in there would, would slip out and stuff like that. Then he had the brilliance, the aha moment. But is it a big idea? One of his colleagues made what was supposed to be the definitive hard bonding glue. It was supposed to be tougher than anything. That it was, he's a research scientist, PhD level, went down the molecular level, looking at ionic bonds and all that sort of stuff. And he was gonna, it was gonna stick solid. Well, turned out it was very, it was very sticky, but just the opposite way. It, it, it came apart and stuck back together real easily. Well, Art thought about that. He said, what if we put that on the slips of paper? And thus came the idea of the post-it notes. But the other thing that Art told me is it was the result of hundreds and hundreds of small ideas, hundreds of small ideas that made that work. There was an aha moment. There was the, the start of it, but all of these small ideas actually made it, made it work. Now, let's build on that a little bit. You ever had a sticky note that didn't stick after the first or second try? especially after the first try, chances are it's not a 3M post-it note. Now I'm not here promoting 3M, but what happened with 3M is 3M had all these ideas. Anyone could copy the idea of a sticky note that was out there in public. Everyone, all competitors could copy that, but they couldn't copy all of those hundreds of ideas that gave them a competitive advantage that has maintained in their sticky notes. So we have a, Huge advantage competitively. Think about it. You have a big idea. Who's the first person to know about it? You're going to broadcast it, right? You're going to broadcast that big idea, and the competitors are going to find out about it. And sometimes the first person to buy your product is a competitor. 
that wants to reverse engineer it or figure out what makes it stick. Even if it's an internal process innovation, if it's a big one, chances are you need to pull in outside consultants. How do consultants make their money? By selling ideas. They're gonna take what they learn from you and sell it to your competitors, sell it to others. So big ideas don't get a sustainable competitive advantage. But if you keep adding small idea after small idea, so yours is working better, so you're more efficient, that's where the competitive advantage comes from. You get this ongoing competitive advantage that can be huge. Uh, frontline improvement creates a learning organization that's capable of constantly growing. If you've got all your people, remember, we're talking about all your frontline people are open and looking at ideas and trying to figure things out. And what happens? Think about what, what happens. You have an idea, small idea, you try it, it works. What are you going to do? You're going to try it elsewhere. You're going to build on it. If it doesn't work quite right, you're going to try something else because it was designed to solve a problem that might have been there that you didn't have quite a solution, but you're trying. You're learning as an organization and all those get embedded then in the process. So they become the new standard work in the process. All those improvements, either, either in terms of how you do something or the technology embeds them. And so the organization is learning and growing. This is where we see one of our favorite examples is, is, is uh, Carl Stortz. Their uh, endoscopes, their um, headquarters actually, the ownership is in Germany, but uh, their North American plant in Connecticut is fascinating because they average 75 improvement ideas implemented per person. We're talking to the CEO, the CEO basically says, we could not produce what we produce, <laughs> produce the products we do, without employee ideas. 50% of our performance is directly attributable to their ideas. They were dealing with fibers that were amazingly thin. I, I just can't even describe it, how they'd, they'd start out with a big tube like this and keep pulling it and heating it and pulling it and heating it and pulling it and heating it, finally ending up with something that was half the size of a hair. Now, then they have people that are taking that half the size of the hair and plugging it in to cameras and other stuff on the end of that endoscope. And they and though the ideas they came up with to do that in practical sense, their competitors didn't have. And so they had capabilities that the competitors didn't. This gets into one of the, the favorite things that, that is a puzzle to me, but at the same time, it proves true and true again. This is the learning rate. What's the rate of improvement in most companies? Well, the organic rate, or a better way of putting it is the average rate across our society, ranges range from about 1% to 3%. 3% is really good. Sometimes um, going into a recession, it drops down to half a percent. There's some macro statistical reasons for this, but that's the average, the average. What would happen if you could learn faster? We we're in companies, we were studying companies that were doing 10, 15 time percent learning, improving every single year. Think of the advantage that creates. And how they were doing it was with a lot of small frontline ideas, small frontline ideas. Uh, there's a whole lot of reasons for small ideas, but I want to go through them relatively fast because it's What's important to me is that you guys get to ask the questions, ask the tough questions so that we can address them here. So I'm going to try to make sure we have time to answer a lot of questions. But the first one is um, small ideas can be replicated. They're, they're leveraged. You've got them one place. You take an idea, you can put it somewhere else. Let me give you an example of an idea. Uh, this was at the, that was replicated a lot. This was at the, at the Washington State, State Police Garage. Actually, the Washington State Patrol Garage, I should say. They call themselves the patrol. This is the highway patrol, okay? And this is the garage that converts factory vehicles to police cars, okay? And uh, they did some fantastic lean work there, just fantastic. They, they were coached by Boeing, of all people, Boeing Airlines, and, and they, just, they, they essentially were able to triple their output in a couple of years because they got ca caught in a crunch, capacity crunch. But one of the ideas was they used to put and measure and place about four 
decals on the side door of each police car on each, each, each side of the front door. And they'd measure them and place them and try to get them straight. And somebody came up with an idea, and you guys can all relate to this, I'm sure. Well, let's just put a template there. So they just bang, put a template there, magnetic attachment, put the decals in place, cut the time by about 75% and also higher quality. Well, they took that template idea and duplicated a dozen other times whenever they had a hole to drill, whenever they had some, some placement to do, they, they, they used the template idea throughout. So leverage, leverage, multiple uses. The other thing is small ideas are quick to implement. You know, if the decision is made, if you're making the decision on the front line or empowering your people, frontline ideas are quick and easy to implement. Now, what does that mean? They're low risk. Why are they low risk? What if you implement a small idea and it doesn't work? What do you do? You undo it. What have you lost? You try something else. You experiment. They're low cost for the most part. Low cost, low risk. You're not going to get in trouble. The other thing is, and this is the secret, this is the secret, and I hope we're going to get into this a little bit later in the discussion. But one of the things about it is you don't need a lot of permission. You don't usually need permission about, beyond your colleagues and your, your immediate supervisor to make these small changes. They're within your domain. You stay within your domain, within your lane. That's what you know. That's what you expert. You don't need a lot of permission, and they usually don't cost much to do. The other thing is management. That's the big thing is management doesn't need to get involved. But here's the kicker. They solve problems managers don't even see. Think about it. Managers, managers are up here. They've got aggregate knowledge. They pull the knowledge from everywhere and they make big picture decisions, strategic, where to focus, customers, all of that sort of stuff. Who has the knowledge on how the process actually works on a day-to-day -day basis? Those are the guys on the front lines. Those are the guys down, down where the action is happening. They're the ones that see what works, what doesn't. They know what works, what's practical, what's cheap, stuff like that. A lot of times, if there's a problem, management comes in, they look at it, what do they do? They throw a bunch of money, experts, consultants at a problem. A lot of times, if they just listen to the people on the front lines, they could solve that problem with a lot of little ideas, nibble it to death by ducks, we like to say. Um, but so the frontline people are in the best position to see what's really going on and how to really solve a problem in the best way. So this gets back to why do small ideas get no respect? Well, think about it. Think about it. Small idea. You have a small idea, you're going to make a process improvement. Okay? You make the process improvement. It works. It maybe saves thousands and thousands of dollars over the next years. But what happens to that idea? It just disappears into the normal operation of the process. Management never knows about it. Management never thinks about it. It was just a little idea. Now you take hundreds or thousands of those little ideas, it makes a huge impact, but they all just disappear. What would happen if those ideas were never there? Well, clearly the process, the organization wouldn't do as well, but what would management see? Management would just see, well, our cost of our cost of production, our cost of doing business, our cost of this is just this. That's the way it is. They wouldn't even know it. So small ideas just poof, disappear in the normal process of, of doing business and they don't get seen. They just become part of the SOP. All that you see is a better running operation, more efficient, more capable. So this is one of the reasons why small ideas don't get much respect, but they're where the real action is. As a matter of fact, what we found is that about 80% of the improvement potential of any organization, potential, is actually in frontline ideas, those small frontline ideas. Think about it. Think about that curve I showed, the two, two, 1 to 3% versus the 10 to 15%. That difference is listening to small ideas. Let's go back to our Coke example. Remember I told you there was a Six Sigma team that looked at it and all they did was find a faster way to clean up the mess? Well, actually there were two teams that looked at it at two different times and they both improved 
the speed at which you could clean up the mess. At the time it was kind of interesting because the plant manager of Coke, Coca-Cola Stockholm bottling came from uh, Scania. And Scania had a wonderful frontline idea system. As a matter of fact, they were learning it. They were one of the companies we tracked for a long time that was learning at 15% a year. Uh, they have a fantastic system just integrated. They shut down the production line once a day where everyone's meeting to solve problems. All the frontline teams, as you can imagine, shutting down a production line. Yeah, that's not something that we normally think of doing for that, but they put that much pressure on, uh, on things. And what they did is, is corporate, they were a corporate owned bottler and corporate in Atlanta decided that, I think they listened to Jack Welsh a lot. They decided Six Sigma is the way to go. We got to go Six Sigma. Now I'm a big fan of Six Sigma for the right thing. Six Sigma is great for certain types of ideas and handling certain types of process improvements. They're usually bigger. They need more study, stuff like that. Not just the just do it. Well, this manager happened to have the experience to have the frontline system set up and have the Six Sigma set up. And so they tracked for a number of years, they tracked the results they got. And what they found was something that we have seen duplicated in terms of ratios. They found uh, they had two black belt projects, they had five green belt projects, and they had uh, uh, 1,720 frontline ideas. The net result is 80% of the savings. Actually, this, this, this uh, stat for this first year was 78% of the savings came from those frontline ideas. They stopped keeping track two years later when they hit 92% of the improvements. So bottom line, the big lesson we get out of this is the best continuous improvement programs are bottom up driven by lots of frontline ideas, lots of small frontline ideas. Now that doesn't mean you don't have your Six Sigma A3s, your uh, Kaizen Blitzes, uh, rapid improvement results, whatever we're calling it. You don't, you have your improvement teams on other projects, but what really adds the horsepower and from the statistics we've done from people that do both and do both well, about 80% comes from the front line, 80% front line. By the way, in staffing all of those uh, it, rapid improvement in Six Sigma projects, A3 projects in, in staffing the teams, I'd encourage you to put a lot of frontline people on th those teams. They're the ones that'll make it practical. The other thing is if they're on the team, it's going to be implementable because it's going to be in their, they've got a stake in it. And they're going to make sure that it's implementable. So just a piece of advice. Now, Systems, to capture this. We've talked about the importance of frontline ideas. Hopefully I've got you intrigued, if not completely convinced. I think most of you have seen enough of this that you know that it's, it's probably true. But the question is, how do you get these frontline ideas? How do you go after them? Well, the answer is not the suggestion box. You know, it's interesting. I've seen, I've, I, there are a number of very large, very sophisticated consulting companies out there that are selling innovation systems. Their innovation system is oftentimes nothing more than an electronic suggestion box. Think of what suggestion boxes do. They put them up, employees voluntarily put notes in the uh, ideas, suggestions in the box. Management has to figure out what these things are all about. You know the most popular suggestion and suggestion boxes across the world? Fire the CEO, fire the CEO. You get a lot of non-functioning ideas. Suggestion boxes can come up with some good ideas, but most managers don't even like to deal with them because it takes their time away trying to figure out these ideas. Trying to figure out these, they get, they get a couple of good ones every once in a while. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about not an idea every once in a while that works. We're talking about lots and lots of them from the front lines. So let's turn to our friends over in, uh, in Fort Wayne. This is a company called Pyramation. Pete Wilson's the president. Uh, while, a while back, uh, Pete was struggling with his, um, his uh, uh, lean initiative. And then he came across the power of frontline ideas and it took off. And so for about 15 years now, he's been averaging in the neighborhood of 30 to 40 five frontline ideas per person per year. 
And he, he's been doing f fantastic things. And this was actually a while ago he made this transition. The big thing he did, he went from six weeks because he's doing thermocouples. Pyromation does thermocouples and temperature control stuff, which, you know, there's just a little bit of overseas competition for that stuff. But what pyromation can do that they can't do is they will now, because of all these ideas, they can literally, if they have to, they can take an order and deliver it and ship it the same day. And that's an order that needs to go through design, manufacturing, and shipping. And they can do it all in the same day if they absolutely have to. But they're normally running three days to a week, depending upon, upon what, they, what, uh, what the demand is. But uh, they've gone through multiple generations of, of idea, frontline idea systems, or front, really frontline idea boards. This, for example, was their third generation. What you have here is you have the people along here, you've got their ideas, they come along, they grab a slip, they fill out the idea, they put it in there. Once a week, they have an idea meeting, they talk about, they pull these, they talk about them, then they put them over here for people to work on. Very simple, keep it at the frontline level. Management doesn't get involved at this level. All right. Usually the people that come up with the idea are also the ones that implement it. Sometimes they need help, in which case they help. Then they have the bigger stuff, the parking lot for things they can't handle immediately and things they forward for ideas or for, have to forward to maintenance or engineering or somebody else. All right. Well, let's look at the fourth generation. And I haven't been back there because of COVID, so I haven't been back in 18 months. But what they were running then is... Uh, they're, they're, it's a fascinating place because one of the things they do is they do cellular, but every piece of equipment is on wheels. Every piece of equipment on wheels. And oh, by the way, the engineering department is in the center of the plant on, on low, low cubicles. So you can just talk directly to the engineer. I mean, it's amazing. It's the first time I've seen that sort of close integration between plant and engineering. But the new one is much simpler. It's just here's the JDIs. Let's just do it. We're going to do this self. These are the ones that are completed. They're keeping track because uh, they have a game they play that uh, everyone, the, the, the minimum is two ideas. The target is two ideas per person per month in your team. They usually overshoot that. Over here, we can't see it, but these are the ones that get escalated. These are the ones that get escalated. The other thing that's interesting about pyromation and how they focus on frontline ideas, they actually have broken up their maintenance department in a very different way. What they do is their maintenance department essentially has a Gemba route. Every one of the maintenance people is assigned to a specific area, not specialty, but area. And they go around and they talk to the frontline folks. They talk to the frontline folks and they talk about their ideas and the frontline folks are asking, well, how do I fix this? And oftentimes an idea will come out of that where they'll work with the frontline, their maintenance will work right with the frontline uh, employee and the frontline employees getting those skills. Matter of fact, it's quite funny that one of the last times I was there, there was a, there was a group in a cell that seemed to be just cluttering in the cell. There were four of them and they seemed to be just drawing. And I was with the plant manager and he looks at this and he says, I wonder what they're doing. He starts walking over there to find out and he gets close and he quickly turns around and comes back to me. Well, what they're they doing is they're doing a five Y. They had a problem, they got together and they were doing a quick five Y to see what was going on. And, and they came up with three small ideas to handle it. Management never even had to get involved. So there are a lot of, what do these systems have in mind? There are a lot of systems out there. We'll get into some of those in a minute, some of the simpler ones. But if you look at what we're talking about, first of all, you want to focus on local problems in your system. You want a system, you want to focus on local problems. You don't want to solve the problems that are outside of your department, outside of your control. None of this. Well, if they'd only give us better products, we'd be better off. Well, if the they is outside and it really is an issue, you go after it. But most of the time, it's an internal upstream uh, partner. And that's a different thing. You don't have control over that. Focus on the local things. Best people to decide. Who's the best people to decide whether an idea is any good? Actually, it's the people closest to it, which would be the person that comes up with the idea, the immediate supervisor, the colleagues around it. They're the ones that should be making the decisions. These decisions shouldn't be forwarded up. Sometimes they are because they need resources or expertise, but for the most part, we wanna stay small. Uh, take a problem focus. A lot of times to get started, you know, 
what do you do? Well, taking a problem focus, you sort of look at what, are, let's take a list of the problems we have. What's the one we want to focus on? You circle that and say, what we're looking for for next week is ideas that help in some little way. We don't have to solve it all at once. We're going to nibble it to death by ducks. Take a problem focus. It comes up with a lot more ideas, problems. Every, even bad ideas have, have, are important. Hopefully we'll get into that in a bit, but you want every one because bad ideas point out a problem. Um, assign responsibility and track, however you do it, however you do it, you want to assign responsibility and track uh, the progress and follow up. And the other thing that a lot of people forget is the last point. You have to celebrate results. Remember how I talked about how little ideas, small ideas, small improvements disappear in the regular operation of companies? Well, the, the same thing happens with progress. You can make fantastic progress and people just get frustrated. One of the reasons they get frustrated is the more people know about continuous improvement, the more problems they see and the more they're frustrated because they can't solve all the problems they see because they don't have the bandwidth to do it. It's just not practical. So the irony in this is the better you are, the more you see problems and the more frustrated you can get. So what you do is you have to make sure every once in a while to celebrate, celebrate your success. Look, over the last three months, we've implemented 135 ideas and we've dropped 20% off of our production cost. We've dropped our fuel use by 8%, uh, you know, whatever it is, celebrate it. And then there's something else that you want to celebrate too. This is a funny one, but celebrate failures. Celebrate failures. Why celebrate failures? Because people fail. They, want to, they, they, they don't want to learn the wrong lesson from failures. And it's therapeutic. So one of the things I've suggested a lot of people do is they don't only celebrate success, but failures. Now, complicated to start that, this, this whole thing. We can go out, we can get, you know, get some big consultant in with a huddle board system or something like that. But you know how you can start this? You can start it very simply. Put up a flip chart. If you don't have a system now, put up a flip chart and say, okay, let's uh, get your ideas. Let's focus on this and, and, and huddle together at, a, at your morning huddle or at a weekly meeting. It can be a stand-up meeting. You don't want it sitting down because you don't need it to last too long. You're sitting there talking about these ideas. It can be a whiteboard. It can be a whiteboard, you know, something nice and visual. My first idea board was actually a gray cinder block wall that I was writing on with chalk. And it happened quite by accident when I was doing a turnaround. The interesting result of that that made me a believer, I was a young engineer with an MBA that got thrown into a, a turnaround of a foundry. And what I found is in six weeks, we increased productivity by 250% and dropped scrap by 80%. How did we do it? With a cinder block wall and a piece of chalk. Piece of chalk. What you don't necessarily want what you don't necessarily want is don't computerize it. Record the results in the computer, perhaps. Share the results with other units, perhaps. But if you record it in a computer system, what happens? You lose that interaction. You lose the dynamic. You lose the real. You lose the visibility you get from, uh, from having a whiteboard or something like that. You lose all that, and you lose that that interaction. What oftentimes happens is one person will come up with a problem that another person has the solution for. One of the systems that we uh, were starting up, we we're trying to help a, um, actually it was a university alumni system, alumni office, trying to set up with a system. And all the ideas that first came in were these big ideas. One of them was to train everyone in um, Excel. So they get their Excel ideas up. Well, we looked at that. We were brought back in to say, uh, you know, what can we do about this? Because they'd stalled. Everyone loved it. They had all these big ideas, but they didn't have the time and the money and the bandwidth to do them. So we went in and uh, that was the first idea. And we sort of said, okay, who came up with that idea? And someone raised their hands and they said, um, why did you come up with it? We asked I said, well, I was doing this and couldn't do that. And I knew it could be done. And I thought, you know, it would be great. We'd all be more productive if we knew how to do that. 
She explained what the problem was and the person right next to her turned to her and says, oh, I can help you with that. It'll take five minutes. So you take where that led to is a discussion and says, okay, we don't have $15,000 and all that time to train everybody. What if we had only $50, what we could do? And we came up with a dozen small ideas to, to exchange expertise and to do other things that just work slick. So don't put it in a computer. Don't put it, hide it away. Now you can start very, very simple. Okay, I'm going to actually, I, I, I promised myself at 45 minutes, I'd uh, stop and uh, take questions. And we're just about there. So um, what I'd like to do is I would take questions. And this is my slide that is my, uh, what do you call it? Shameless commerce division, as the car guys used to call. It's got copies of our last two books out there. Our next book, which is really interesting, is of all things on continuous improvement in government. That's been accepted and it'll be out uh, next, uh, next year. But uh, it has a lot of lessons for private sector as well. But anyways, any questions? I know somebody that wants to start off with a question. Well, yes, it's one of the one of the advantages of being the, the MC is that I get to I get to jump in first and ask the first and last question. So, um, you know, I, I think you, you say it was a great presentation, and it's one we haven't really covered in Wabash Valley Lead Network before. So it's uh, I, I think it really hits home with a lot of us, and a lot of us have been involved with suggestion box systems in the past that, as you said, don't work real well. But uh, you talked about a little bit on how you start, but do, do you can you just elaborate on that? Because I said I'm sitting here raring to go, but I'm still not real sure what I do this afternoon when I get back to to. Uh, you know, the shop floor or the hospital or the construction site. What what do I do? Do I do I is a small group or just just how would you suggest those actual steps to get started? Okay. You know, you start where you are, of course. And but let's let's make an assumption. Let's make an assumption that we don't want to uh, bother upper management with it, or maybe even upper management has no respect for frontline ideas, small frontline ideas. What do you do to get started? And the answer is, it all depends. Do you have a weekly meeting, a regular meeting with your, your staff or not? What's, what's your pace? How do you slide ideas into it? Very simply, you can start, let's say, you, 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 let's say you've got a whiteboard. I've done this before in a, in a, in a university, office, audio, uh, university office when I got stuck in administration for a while. I took the staff and once a week we'd meet and, and We'd say, okay, what are our big problems? We identified our problems in terms of the, what we're recurring and we pick one and we'd focus on it. And everybody would come along and they'd write their ideas on the board and we'd look at them, we'd discuss them the next week. Start simple, start small. This is small ideas, start small. You don't have to be overly complicating this. Start with a flip chart if you don't have a, a or a cork board. Or like I like I said uh, in a plant, I had a, a I had a, a cinder block wall, a gray cinder block wall that I took some welding chalk, and it started quite by accident when somebody challenged an issue we had. I, I it was my first day on the job and the turnaround, I'm writing it on the on the wall. So it isn't complicated to get started, and then learn your way from there. Every time you get a little question, somebody says, "Well." I think we need five different types of peanut butter in the commissary. Okay, is that an appropriate idea? Well, it's an idea. We ran into one CEO that hated frontline idea systems because that was one of the questions that got escalated all the way up to his point that he had to adjudicate five different types of peanut butter. Now, focus it on the problems that you, you're dealing with. Another trick in getting started is, is by asking your people, your, your group, it needs to be a small group. You don't want it too large, a small group, anywhere from uh, off the top of my head, I'd say three to three to about 12, you know, a little higher than that, but you don't want it higher, bigger than that. And you really need to segment it out, but start out by asking them, what are the things that really bug you? What are the problems that you face on your job that are facing you every day? What are the things you hate to do? And use that as a starting point to get them involved, fixing things that bother them. Does that address what you're looking for? Yes, that's uh, 
It's, it's still always hard to get started. And that's it's, one of the things we always, always uh, emphasize here. You're, you're not going to, you're not going to feel like you're an expert when you're starting something new, but the, it is so important just to start and, and you'll, you'll get better every time you do it, every session you have, but that's the, like many things in life. The, the hard part is, is that first step in getting started. So, um, yes. As, as you grow and you learn, you might, you might find a way to plug plug the the small ideas into your A3 process. Let's say you've got an A3 process already, or even a Six Sigma process, or some sort of formal process that works sometimes. A lot of times, some of the bigger ideas that are happening down here can be plugged in and become one of those larger projects, one of those larger projects. But the point is, the people on the front line are oftentimes better at identifying the best projects and the people in the top. We ran into that at a naval base in, on the West Coast with, um, with Six Sigma projects. They found that it, they, they, had, they had this system where they budgeted where, where you <laughs> could have frontline driven Six Sigma projects, but they budgeted for 80% of the improvement coming from the, the, uh, the ones driven by the officers and the, the people up. What they found when they had analyzed the data was 80% actually came from those frontline driven, those frontline initiated Six Sigma projects. So it's it 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 will good frontline idea system will accelerate your Six Sigma program or your A3 program or your rapid improvement uh, events. Take a rapid improvement event. You want to staff it with the people in that area because they're going to keep you from making stupid mistakes and it's going to be implementable. First rapid improvement events. They did a study on it. As a matter of fact. Uh, one of my one of my graduate students was involved in a in a in a doctoral level thesis on it. And they found that 80%, 70 to 80% of rapid improvement events failed within six months because they didn't take into consideration everything on the front line. So staff those with your frontline people too. So how about the the whole thought of um the organization being supportive and and not only the the not only the the top level guys though you certainly need that but if you're a if you're say working working on the front line you're you're in retail or or you're you're the you're the guy swinging the sweat sledgehammer out on a construction site you're you're the person doing the work and and you've got some good ideas how, how do you get your even your manager to think about that? So it's sort of a true prong question from sort of from the bottom up. How do you start it from the front line to the next layer? But then also, how do you get the, the top level management to, to buy into this and say, hey, this small idea thing, that's that's pretty cool stuff. All right. Let's let's start. It's sort of the team level. If you're an individual, you got to convince your team member and your team boss, uh, team lead to play it, play it. But you can literally start at the team level. What do you do for 10 minutes before or five minutes before the start of a shift and five minutes at the end of the shift? You just gather together. This is planning time. How, what are we going to do today? And you start asking questions. You know, do you have any, this is how we plan on doing it. You got anyone, anyone have any ideas on how we might do it better? Bang. We've got to start at the end of the day. You know, close out the last five minutes. Everyone's in a rush to go, but hey, if you can get that last five minutes, how do we do today? How the changes we made work? What could we do better next time? Bang! All of a sudden, in your little bitty team, be it in an office, be it on a construction site, be it in a factory, your little bitty group, you started. You started. You started listening to the folks on the front line. And you know the nice thing about that too, it's an opportunity to coach and to educate. If they're giving you stupid ideas, you got to think of why this is an important person. He's not just a smart ass. Is he just dumb? No. Chances are, a bad idea. When you see a bad idea like that, chances are, it identifies a problem, but just not a solution. And you get to spend a little bit of time saying, "Hmm, how'd you come up with that?" That's interesting. Why'd you come up with that? Say, oh, I was looking at this, and what we have is we always lose this last eight inches uh, of, of material, and I think it's a waste and all that sort of stuff. And I says, hmm, you know, that idea won't work because of this. 
But keep thinking about that. What if you do this? And oh, by the way, you might want to talk to Charlie. He's, he's got some good ideas on that. So all of a sudden, in a couple of days, the guy's back with an idea that does work. Yeah. It's in now taking it up to the next level is pretty much just that. You do the same tactic at the next level. And eventually, if you're in part of and you're in charge of a department that you're doing this, usually you've got enough, even a small department. Uh, you usually have got enough uh, uh, leeway so that you could throw together a um, that you, you could throw together a, a, a flip chart or a whiteboard, which basically takes it and puts it out there, and you're using this. And then after a while, when you got some results, you invite the big boys down. You invite first your manager, and then going right up and show them what you're doing. You know, it's the classic going to Gemba, but you got to show them firsthand because they don't see the improvements and then just be ready to have your guys explain what they did and why and what the results were. And most of the time, most people will look at that and sort of say, huh, that's interesting. They might not even know what's going on, but you sort of use this gorilla approach. Is it perfect? Does it happen all the time? No, but there's always a certain amount of authority you do have that you can do this, but you just do it under the radar. That's the big thing we're finding in our latest study in government is changing government is so difficult that what we're seeing is where the action is, is under the radar, where it doesn't get, get the, have the, 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 the checks and balances, bureaucracy and different camps that you run into when you try to make a big change. And so we're seeing organizations in government making fantastic changes, but they're flying under the radar. Good. We had a, we had a sort of a follow-up question that um, asking, how about an individual just taking off and sort of doing it on our, his own without involving the team or without, without a whiteboard or, you know, here's something that bugs him and he thinks he can fix it. And um, so I, I want to preface your answer by saying that the, the the downside of that is the organization doesn't know this good thing happened and, and you can't spread it throughout the organization. Right. I'll let you answer the question. It, it, it's, it's highly situational. My, my students always uh, uh, learn very quickly, sometimes with a little frustration when they ask me a question, my answer is it depends. It depends, it's highly situational. If you're in a situation where you can just fix something, and it's within your authority or, or, or you can bootleg it enough, just do it, just do it. And then what you can do is you might talk to your buddies about it. You might uh, eventually talk to the supervisor just to let them know. It all depends on your supervisors. Some supervisors are jerks. Let's face it, we're in the real world here. But uh, the point is, uh, what you want to do is as much as you can, you want to get the feedback from the other people involved, especially if the other people have to use the same process or the same tool or the same equipment. If it's something that is just you, fix it. Then what happens is your colleagues are going to look at that and say, huh, that's clever. And they'll borrow it. They'll borrow it. But uh, you know, it all depends on the situation you're in. If, if you've got a supportive boss, go to him and say, boss, I want to do this. And if the boss is worth a darn, boss is going to say, that's a good idea. What do you need for help? Uh, now, that might not happen. But uh, uh, like I said, it's all contingent. But I'll tell you something. If, you're, if you get the reputation for the guy that's always fixing things and making them smoother, you're going to get the supervisor's attention. The supervisor's going to... Then you say, you know, we can do this as a whole team. The supervisor might think, hey, it's going to make me look good. That's the other thing about this. If you're in a supervisory position or a management position, the people under you can make you look real good if you let them. So a lot of your examples have been um, manufacturing related. And certainly as we went through... Uh, through process improvement, we see that a lot of manufacturing ideas could transfer to healthcare pretty easily. But what about education and financial services and, and IT folks and the office environment? I can see where it's sort of the same, but it's not always the same. Yeah. Any thoughts there? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. One of, one of the big, one of the big um, crimes 
eh, might be a little strong. One of the big things that's a shame, and even uh, Womack says this. Uh, when I was talking to Womack the other day, when we were both on a other day a couple of years ago, when we were on, the, on a stage together, he says one of the biggest problems is this lean, and it's start in management, and it's the Toyota manufacturing system or the Toyota management system. But the whole thing is that it didn't take advantage of the office. The biggest opportunities for improvement right now are in office environments and in um, in the interface between organizational units, either within or beyond uh, uh, a company. That's where the real big improvements can, can take place. There is nothing that doesn't work in an office environment, but one of the things we're finding is that the big thing is they get tied up in terminology. They get tied up in terminology and training and black belts and macho and, and you got to have these tools and you got to use these tools a certain way or bullshit. I mean, that's all important as part of the learning, but the important thing is thinking and being able to analyze and solve problems. And what we see is a lot of language change is sometimes effective when you move, sometimes effective, sometimes not. But when you move into an office environment or a healthcare environment or a finance environment, we've got a lot of uh, a lot of finance organizations we go into. IT, it's IT essentially what lean is in IT to a certain extent is is um, is agile. It's agile with scrums and stuff like that. Scrums are custom made for frontline ideas, man. You think about that, you get them together at the beginning, you, you anticipate the problems you're gonna have, you anticipate how to solve them, you do a post-mortem. Man, it works very well. I've worked with a couple of software houses on that and it works surprisingly well. Matter of fact, better than it does in manufacturing, I think, but it is much more active. Uh, the biggest challenge I had with uh, that environment is they always wanted to use a technical fix in terms of put the ideas into a system. Now, we ended up with cork boards and everyone loved them because you can move things around very easily. It's very visual. Uh, for some remote stuff, we use Trillo. Uh, but it, it works in just about every environment. Now, the toughest one we found found so far is uh, one of the fun ones we, we did was the Stockholm Police. Stockholm Police did an excellent job of it. But one of the tough ones is education because the nature of education Education at the primary school level, we've got some wonderful examples of that uh, in our upcoming book um, on how they made major changes, uh, major improvement at the frontline level in educational results in, um, in uh, New Brunswick, uh, Canada. But uh, when you get in the universities, it gets a little tricky because you got the admin side and the faculty side and they're so far apart. So it's a little trickier on the faculty side. And the admin side, we've used it a lot. And, uh, have uh, increased efficiency on that end quite well. But when it gets down to faculty, there's, uh, hey, I can criticize, I am one. Uh, we, we're pretty independent, we're pretty independent. And I think there's room for it, but it's a, it's a, it's a little tougher. Every time we've, we, we haven't been as successful with our own colleagues as we have been with the administration. Education. Faculty and doctors are uh, two tough ones. It always seems like they, it seems like every every kind of the conversations we have, those, those two come up. So we well, got more. Well, we have PhDs and we have doctors and we have all this education. We know better, don't we? Um, seemingly. Like. Go on day. Uh, Gawande and his checklist manifest. He's a doc. He's a surgeon. Excellent book. A, a book that's fun to read. You also saw him a lot on the um, on the COVID uh, talking heads experts uh, lately. But uh, that's one to follow. Uh, he's the closest thing I can come to lean with doctors. Well, a couple more um, questions here. Good questions. So sometimes, sometimes you can just look at your system and say it's hopeless. I mean, <laughs> like, like this system is so screwed up. We can have small ideas till the cows come home, but but the whole system's broke. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, from the small idea perspective, how do you, how do you how do you deal with the the whole broken system idea? Well, the small ideas help you with uh, institutionalizing workarounds. So that's that is a help. But uh, uh, there is there are every every once in a while every once in a while you have to blow up the system and start start from scratch. But uh, what I can tell you 
is once you do that, if you jump on the new system with small ideas, it'll come up to speed and be optimized much faster and you'll get more out of it. But uh, if I was talking to managers that were in charge of the system and could blow it up and start different, what I would do is before getting your new system, I would sit down with those frontline folks and give a good talk, give, give a good uh, listen to them to find out what they, need, what they really need in the new system and what was really not working in the old system and get them involved in that process. It'll save you a lot of time. The other thing is it'll get them the ownership. So then when it comes up, they're going to come up with the ideas. You know, this isn't working quite right in this system. Let's change it like this. So there are times when you have to blow up the new system and start over again. But uh, before doing that, what I would do is I would optimize the old system. And then, then you, because what it gives you is it now gives you an example to, to argue your case that we need a new system up to higher levels because you can show everything you've done. You can show the limitations. You can do all of that. And if the bosses have any brains at all, and, uh, and, and look at that and you make the case, they're gonna say, okay, I'll try to find a budget for it. Well, that may be a bit of a leap with bosses having brains, but that's a whole, <laughs> other, no, whole other subject. Um, oh, by the way, one of the things we do, we, we do study is why bosses don't have brains, but that's a whole different yeah, topic. Yeah, we'll have to bring you back for that one. Um, so a lot, of our, a lot of our membership, they're, they're actually full-time, doing process improvement. I mean, they're, they're, they may be a green belt, may be a black belt, uh, may just be, you know, learn some lean techniques. Maybe, maybe they don't know any of that stuff. They're, 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 their focus is just on improving processes within their organization. So percentage wise, how, how do you think they break up their day between trying to encourage these small ideas and, and draw create this sort of framework versus the traditional Kaizen events and, and, the, and the bigger projects that, they're, that they've typically been working on. So, so how, how do you think that, uh, or how should they think about it as, as, they're, as they're encouraged by your talk and see some value here, but how, how do they get started and, and where do you think they should be percentage wise? Well, um, it all depends. I hate to use that one again, but it depends on where you are and what you're dealing with and, and depending on where in the organization is. There's a couple of things that I would suggest right off the bat. The first thing is if you're in a situation where you're pulling teams together, you know, make sure you pull a good bunch from the front lines that can rep rep represent the front lines and that could have that thinking in there. The other thing is when you've got something that you're going to put in place, Present it to them and ask for their ideas. Get, you can go to them and uh, uh, ask for their ideas, ask for their concerns. And if nothing else, it shows that you care and it shows you're approachable. So when you're starting to put it in and they have some ideas or some issues, you know, they're more likely to come, come to you. When you implement one of those changes, one of the other, one of my favorite tricks when you're implementing a change like that, say you got a big project and big project change and you're implementing the change, you go around to the people that are actually going to use it <clears throat> and you say, I want you to complain. I want you to tell me what's working, what's not, what the problems are, all that sort of stuff. And then your team or you or your team should jump all over those to, to fix them. Some things you can't fix, some things you can, but even if you can't fix something, if you fix three and you can't fix one, you talk to the person, you treat them like a human being, like an adult, they're going to understand. They might come up with this idea that surprises you. But the point is, depending on what you're doing. Now, if you're in a position, say you're a, um, a lean improvement facilitator or a lean improvement manager or something like that, are there frontline supervisors, frontline managers, frontline leaders who would be interested in your help to set up an idea like this and formalize it and let it even flow into some of the ongoing work you're doing? That's the type of thing you can do. It all depends on where you are, what you're doing, what your, what your um, license is, so to speak. I was just talking with uh, somebody in results, um, rapid results in Illinois, which is basically Illinois State uh, uh, Lean Group. 
And they were extremely frustrated because they knew the power of frontline ideas, but they kept getting these big projects thrown at them. And so they were, they were, they were very frustrated. And so we, we, worked, we tried to work out some ways to take advantage of where the real power and where the real ideas are on even some of these bigger problems. But recently the challenge has been, how do you do it remotely for the last 18 months? They had a 56 page manual on how to do it. It was actually quite good. It was actually quite good, but it's common frustration. So you made, you made a great point and, and I'm just gonna comment on it too because I've seen it throughout the years. In, in any group or any team, there's always the people that like to talk and, and then they'll, and they'll have a hundred ideas and then they'll always be the quiet people. That, that don't really say a lot. And, and I think you made the point there of making sure you ask everybody, what do you see as problems? What can we do better? Because you these quiet folks, often they're, they're the ones that really see it. And you'll be surprised if you just give them a chance to talk and encourage them to talk, what, what they can share with you um, in terms of great ideas. Oh, absolutely. There are a number of tricks to that. There are a number of tricks to that. One of them, if somebody's quiet, you go up to them ahead of time. You talk to them while they're at their regular work and you try to get an idea out of them. And then you start out the next meeting and say, Jose had a wonderful idea because Jose might not speak English as well as he should, or not as well as he should, excuse me. Uh, he, English is his second language. I'm no good with German, which would be my second language. I'm lousy with it. So why should, why should Jose be better? But the point is he's quiet, he's shy. Uh, Jose had a good idea, and I thought, I thought I'd share it with you guys, and so you start out with Jose's idea. The other way you do it is, like you were saying, just, just, just call on them. Call on the quiet ones first. Uh, I always remember a tactic by Lyndon Johnson, President Johnson, and he'd have his staff meetings, and what he would do is he would always go around the room in a certain order, and he'd seat people in a certain order. If he wanted to do something, he would seat the people that were most opposed to it on his right in descending order and the people that were most supportive on his left. And then he'd start out with people talking on their left. And so by the time they got around to the people on the right. But I'm not saying you do that, you know, cook the, cook the audience, but what, what, what it does do is you start out with the quiet people, you talk to them first, you talk to the noisy ones, the ones that always have an opinion later. And then it's also fair for you to take one of the noisy ones and say, what did you think of Jose's idea? What do you think of Sally's idea? What do you think of Jane's idea? So you pull, you pull them in from a different angle. So it's they're supporting the other person's idea or having to come in, 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 a, in, in, a, in a group. You know, there's a lot of tricks. You know, what we're finding that's interesting is the biggest thing in going after small ideas as a frontline leader is not your knowledge of methods not your knowledge of methods, but your knowledge of leadership and human, human interaction and how to lead people instead of how to manage and direct people. That's the, big, that's the big thing. That's much more effective. And being sensitive to that interpersonal element in it, because every one of those people on your team is different and motivated by different things. And you've got to understand that. Okay, well, we're running out of time. People have 12, 30 things that they got to start getting ready for. But I'm going to ask one more question. You know, so maybe we got the right idea to get started. We're, we're excited about this. We're going out this afternoon with our flip charts. But, uh, you know, this isn't going to this isn't going to gel immediately. So how do you keep how do you keep the focus and momentum going sort of as you're figuring this out and, and your folks are figuring this out and the people you're talking to are figuring this out and you, you generate ideas and they don't get done as fast as you want. How, how do you keep that focus and momentum? It's so a couple of things. One is, one is you, you celebrate. You celebrate the successes. The other thing is you keep it fresh by focusing on new problems. You start out. The other thing is you don't start out necessarily on your biggest problem, but you start out on problems that can give you traction, that you can make victories on. You start out with, I hate to use the term, the low-hanging fruit. But you start on things that are visible, that can be something can be done about it, that are within your domain, and then you move out from there. Don't get caught up with that we don't get the support we need or it's their problem, we can't do anything about it. Avoid those. Um, just, just keep it fresh. The other thing is um, come up with some five-minute idea activators. That's one of our favorite things is what 
can they look at something, how can they look at something differently and come up with new ideas? It could be everything from uh, a, a quick thing on the single minute exchange of die. How do you do something fast? If you're not teaching everyone um, 5S, you can do a five minute primer on 5S. People will get the idea and start, start looking for ideas there. Somewhere they can look at for new ideas and look at ideas in a different way. You know, we've just had a, um, a course on X. How can we apply X? What are some ideas on applying X? You got to keep it fresh, keep it going. And the other thing you got to do is every once in a while, and this is why you sometimes celebrate failures, because when you celebrate a failure, you can move on, keep going, but you celebrate successes so people can see it. They don't get lost in the day to day. Hey, I want to thank you guys. This has been great. Uh, I just wish I could talk to more of you face to face. Um, if any of you have any questions you didn't get a chance to answer, you didn't get a chance to ask and get answered, shoot me an email, dean.schroeder at Valpo, Valparaiso University, valpo.edu. Uh, and I will um, gladly get back to you. Doug, it's all yours to close us out. Take us home. Yeah, I'm not even going to go up front to the to the podium here. I'm just going to do it from behind the scenes. So uh, let's give a big uh, virtual thank you to uh, Dr. Schroeder for. I mean, that was a that was a really cool presentation. Uh, I, I learned a lot, and I'm actually motivated to go out and uh, start some small ideas here on my own. So, uh, and thanks for making the drive down here. It was, it was You're very great. Welcome. Uh, it's a privilege. Thanks for everybody that that. Uh, logged in and, and watched it. I think uh, I think you've got some real value out of this. Uh, I appreciate the questions. Think about joining Wabash Valley Lead Network. If, you, if you're trying to find us, it's just wvln.org or type in Wabash Valley Lead Network. We're, we, we come right up there. So um, if you got questions for for the, for Dr. Schroeder, um, certainly you can, you can funnel those through me too. And uh, Again, think about think about joining the group if you're not part of it. It is a great group to be in, and uh, we're going to be uh, back live and in person in August, uh, God willing. So uh, we'll see you all then. Thanks again, and adios. Thanks for your time. <laughs>